pemphigus vulgaris and pemphigus foliaceus. The first difference is defect. Here desmoglin 3 is involved as I just now told you and here desmoglin 1 is involved. But remember one important point that as the disease progresses, later in the disease, desmoglin 1 also gets involved. Okay. So, normally desmoglin 3 gets involved, but later in the disease, desmoglin 1 also gets involved in cases of vulgaris. Now, this desmoglin 3 is mainly present in buccal mucosa. Well, this desmoglin 1 is mainly present in skin. So, because this is mainly present in buccal mucosa and this is mainly present in skin, what is the one very important differentiating feature between vulgaris and polyaceous? Yes. Clinically, you should always look for buccal mucosal involvement. This buccal mucosal involvement is seen in vulgaris, but it is absent in polyaceous. So, this is one very important differentiating feature between vulgaris and polyaceous that is if buccal mucosa is involved, it is vulgaris, while buccal mucosa is never involved, it is always spared in polyaceous. Then skin can be involved in both and over skin you will get blisters. These are suprabasal in cases of vulgaris, but these are subcorneal in cases of foliaceous. Now, both are intraepidermal, they are within epidermis and when the lesion is within epidermis, which is the most superficial layer of the skin, what can happen? They can easily rupture. So, these blisters can very easily rupture and when they rupture, what they form? They form erosions with crusting. So, later in the disease, erosion with crusting can be seen. Then there is one sign which is very important to elicit in these cases. So, clinically look for a sign and that is Nikolsky sign. So, Nikolsky sign is seen. Now, what is Nikolsky sign? If this is the blister of pemphigus, when we apply tangential pressure, Tangential pressure, that is the pressure parallel to the skin. So, when we apply tangential pressure, that is the pressure parallel to the skin, over adjacent area, the overlying epidermis separates. Okay. So, when we apply tangential pressure, what happens? The overlying epidermis separates. This is known as positive Nikolsky sign. Now, this positive Nikolsky sign is seen positive in both vulgaris as well as foliaceous. Why? Because why this epidermis starts separating? Because the desmoglin are defective, the additions are weak and the small pressure can lead to separation of the keratinocytes or the epidermis. So, because the desmoglin are involved in both, the Nikolsky sign can be seen positive in both. The next difference is investigations. There are two important investigations which can be done. One is histology and on histology, you will find acanthocytes. I have already discussed acanthocytes. These are formed due to acantholysis that is separation of keratinocytes. So, when the keratinocytes start separating from all the sites, they acquire oval shape with large nucleus and perinuclear condensed cytoplasm giving a halo around it. Such type of cells are known as acanthocytes and they can be seen positive in both. Another histological finding is row of tombstones appearance. This is also seen in both. And here what is happening that normally if you examine a stratum basal, okay. So, normally if you examine a stratum basal, you will find these basal keratinocytes. So, these are the basal keratinocytes. This is how normal stratum basal appears. But if you examine the same layer that is a stratum basal in a case of pemphigus, then it will appear something like this. That is these keratinocytes are having gaps in between and all these keratinocytes are present in a linear fashion. So are the row of tombstones, tombstones that is the stone which is present besides a grave. So, if this is one grave, 
and this is that stone you will find in a graveyard there is a row of graves and a row of these stones can be seen so these stones are generally present in a row having gaps in between so are these keratinocytes which are present in a row having gaps in between so when you see this specimen it resembles a row of tombstones so this is the appearance which is seen and as i told you because desmoglin are defective in both so separation is taking place in both and that's why this appearance can be seen in both vulgaris as well as foliaceous another investigation is a dif dif stands for direct immunofluorescence so what we do in direct immunofluorescence we take the specimen of the skin let us consider that this is epidermis and these are the keratinocytes which are present here so we took this specimen so in direct immunofluorescence what we do we look for these antibodies and these antibodies are fluorescent so you can very easily see them under microscope okay now these antibodies are targeting which antigen they are formed against desmoglin so in pemphigus desmoglin is involved so that's why these antibodies are targeting desmoglin and desmoglin is present where it is present in between the keratinocytes that is somewhere here so these antibodies also go and deposit here not inside the keratinocytes but over the surface of the keratinocytes that is in between the keratinocytes isn't it so when you see this specimen under fluorescent microscope what you will find you will find the fluorescence over the surface of these keratinocytes something like this giving which appearance a net like appearance so a fish net like pattern is seen is it only seen in pemphigus vulgaris no it is seen in both pemphigus vulgaris as well as foliaceous then what is the difference the difference is that this fish net like pattern which is seen in cases of pemphigus vulgaris is due to anti desmoglin 3 more than one antibodies while this one is due to anti desmoglin 1 antibodies I hope this is very clear because in foliaceous only antibodies are being formed against desmoglin 1 and their deposition is taking place leading to this fish net like pattern while here in vulgaris both antibodies are involved and that is the reason for this fish net like pattern. So pattern is same but the antibodies are mainly against desmoglin 1 in foliaceous while they are against 3 as well as 1 in vulgaris. The last point here is treatment. In the treatment of this pemphigus, we use various modalities. Here, antibodies are being formed, so we give immunosuppressive drugs. They can be used in both vulgaris and foliaceous, but the prognosis of foliaceous is better. Why? Because there the lesions are more superficial. They are subcorneal, just below stratum corneum. So, the prognosis is good. Okay, so generally, they respond to topical management or sometimes just steroids, but other modalities are needed in cases of vulgaris. The modalities can be so you can start with topical steroids so you can give in topical form immunosuppressants like topical steroids or you can give systemic steroids there is one pulse therapy which is generally used in cases of pemphigus that is known as dcp where d is for dexamethasone which is a steroid c is for cyclophosphamide and p is for pulse so this pulse therapy is given that is dexamethasone cyclophosphamide pulse where we admit the patient and for the initial three days of a month we give high dose of dexamethasone and cyclophosphamide then we discharge the patient and for the next 27 days of the month patient takes low dose of cyclophosphamide tablet at home then again next month the patient comes and for the first three days high dose of dexamethasone and cyclophosphamide is given and then again the patient is discharged and for the next 27 days again low dose of cyclophosphamide tablet is given so such therapy is continued in a case of 
pemphigus. These are known as DCP that is dexamethasone cyclophosphamide pulse therapy. But because we are giving dexamethasone which is injectable steroid, so it can lead to various side effects and sometimes it is contraindicated. So in such cases you can use newer drugs that is a biological drugs. The newer biological drug which is used is rituximab which is anti CD20. If you are very enthusiastic and you want to take out all the circulating antibodies from the blood, you can do plasma pheresis. And there is also role of IVIG, intravenous immunoglobulins. So all these are the modalities which can be used in the cases of pemphigus.